Aloha, Mary Lou, and welcome to chapter four. As we break apart these chapters, what new ideas did you and your team members gain from the material and from each other? Using the pitfalls to avoid section of each chapter, describe some of the things you may have seen educators or parents do in the past. Describe your observations of how these behaviors negatively affect the children. What goals do you and your flecka friends see as being important in your journey in building new skills? So from the pitfalls, I'm one thing that I think I'm really bad at doing with my own children, actually two things, is um, I correct and overestimate my abilities of the children. So with Raina, she, um, she is in a climbing phase right now, yes, and she wanted to climb a tree in the park because she saw another little girl doing it, and Kevin went ahead and let her do it. I wasn't there, so thank goodness, but she got to do it, and she got to climb up the tree, but when he sent me the text message of, so Raina's climbing a tree right now, my first instinct was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Get her down from that tree. Do not let her, like, she's not even three. Do not let her climb a tree. And then he sends me a video, and she is just so happy. Like, I can't even express how happy she was. And she's just so proud of herself. And, I'm in a tree, Daddy. I'm in a tree. And it was really cute. So I'm glad that he actually let her do that. But there's so many times when Rain is, like, trying to do something, or even Owen is trying to do something, and I'm like, well... Maybe you shouldn't, but I see how that, like, that wouldn't instill confidence, and that wouldn't tell them that they're valuable or capable or that they can make an make a influence in their environment or anything like that. So I will try and be more mindful with my own children. Yeah, that's actually a really bad one for me, too. I just don't want the children getting hurt while I'm in charge of them. I don't, I don't want their parents getting mad at me because their child got injured on my watch. Yeah, so it's kind of like, I, I know you probably can do this. I just don't want your parents being mm -hmm. mad at me for allowing you to do this and getting and hurt. I think, like, the whole incident report thing, like, what it's called, like, really puts it's, fear into you. Like, just the name of it, incident report. Oh, my gosh, terrifying. if this child falls or have an incident report, like, two weeks into placement, I had an incident report. The last and I did week. not even know what I was doing, but I was the one that witnessed it. Of course, I had to write it. It was probably the worst written incident report they've ever <laughs> seen in history, but yeah. I didn't really... You know, and I think, like, the name of it, it's just, like, kind of scares you. Like, you don't want anything happening on your watch. You don't want parents mad at you or to ruin a relationship you just kind of started to build on. But at least you got practice on on how to write one. And, like, most of us probably didn't at our placement. No. I, the only incident at my placement that we had, I purposely didn't see it because I just, like, I don't want to be up to, I don't want to be in charge of writing this incident report. Please do not let me write this. I know it's going to be bad. Yeah. Um, and then the person who wrote it was like, I don't even know how to write this right now. I'm like, you, you've been an EC for how long? You can't write an instant report. That's great. Yeah, and I think the whole, like, uh, serious occurrence thing is, it's, it makes you feel like, well, this child is in my custodial care, so mm -hmm. I am a temporary legal guardian. How does that fall back on me? How does that make me look as a professional? But I think we need to remember that Every person that interacts with children or has children in their life knows that children fall, children hurt themselves, but so do we, right? We, we fall do that and all we the hurt time. ourselves yep. all the time, and children are much more resilient than yeah. we are. They bounce back so quicker. Sometimes, if you don't even make a fuss about the fact that they have just fallen, they won't even realize, they won't even realize that yeah. Raina now is at the point where she trips. She just starts busting out laughing, and she's just like, That's she'll look of... around and like see if somebody, she'll get up and smack her leg and just laugh. Like, they're just very resilient, and they just... I did notice that over the weekend, there was like, at the Waldorf event that I was at, there was this toddler, infant in toddler stage, like just getting into that stage, um, and she was kind of, you know, doing her thing. Well, she tripped over a carpet, and I kind of like... 
looked around to see if anybody, because this 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 infant going into toddler stages looked around, literally looked around the whole entire room to see if she was going to get a reaction. And she did not get a reaction. She got up, dusted herself off, and kept going. This happened about four times throughout the day. And as long as no one acknowledged that infant, then there was no turmoil, right? Because they're just so resilient. If you let them break a bone when they're younger, it'll feel better than when they're adults. Yeah, and if you break them, what feel better? That's it. Feel better. Oh. Feel better. <laughs> yeah. Feel better. God. If I broke a bone now, now, I'd be in a cast for like weeks. Their bones are weeks. so like malleable, right? Yeah. yeah. So Especially if they're an infant, it's even harder for them to break a bone. So it's better mm -hmm. that they fall down. Yeah. I think one of the like pitfalls for me, my biggest one, and then this is not so much. I wouldn't do this in front of a child. But I do do this with coworkers and like even with my own nieces and nephews and talking to like their parents about it is parenting is parenting like you know like there was a little boy and he called me beautiful and like I thought that was really cute to me it was adorable how he said it you're, you're very beautiful and I think that's adorable never did I think that there was anything wrong with that now that I'm reading this I like feel like a deep sense of guilt like that. Even feel though like I you're think it's, him. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not mocking him. Like, it it was really neat that he was able to like come to the point where he's like, "You're very beautiful," and just the way that it sounded is cute. And I guess I gotta get out of this thing of like thinking things are cute. Like, this is who this child is, and this is how he talks, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I just gotta get into the stage of like, I call it cutisizing everything. You're making saying like everything's great. cute. Just yeah. that needs to be in the dictionary. There's nothing wrong with thinking what children do is cute. It's just over emphasizing the cuteness of what they do. I think um, it becomes a problem when it's just something that's surface, right? Like you're not really digging deeper into who that child is, and you're just um, you're not promoting a sense of value or capability, or that they have influence or worth or competence or control in their environment, right? You're just telling them they're cute. It's very surface. surface level. It's so surface. It's not saying anything about who they are as a person and what they're evolving into. Yeah. I think like my biggest pitfall is probably hesitating to speak. Like just mm -hmm. trying to find the right words yeah. to when speaking with a child so you don't so I don't end up parroting, so I don't end up like mm -hmm. say coughing. Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanna use effective phrase and like use behavioral questions. It's just finding the right words to say it mm -hmm. that I'm struggling with. It's just really difficult at this point. I think I'll find that more of a challenge when I go to placement in school because you're so worried about what that site is like, what their culture is in that site too, and mm -hmm. you don't know what they allow. I find myself like after a few days of not, like my first few days of very nervous. I didn't say a lot, even though I'm a really talkative person. That's like, I had very shocking. Very, hard time and then I kind of just dawned on me that like I just needed to take initiative and just start doing things so just started doing like I started talking to the kids more and like it's like asking them things and like prompting them with different mm -hmm. like wonderment type things and even like I just started taking initiative in general and just started doing things instead of like going to my host is this okay is that okay and I kind of just, the ball just kept rolling. Yeah, because she'll tell you if you're doing something wrong, wrong right? Yeah, yeah. Like, at the end of the day, she'll be like, well, I don't really, they did tell me, like, they're like, you know what? You aren't, you aren't effectively a praise, you're, you're not effectively praising, like, the children. Because, like, I go, oh, well, that's very pretty, and that's very beautiful, and that's very pretty. And it was the same all across the board. Every kid, it was pretty and beautiful. It took me about two and a half weeks to learn that I needed to say, and even still, to say, you worked very hard on that. It's actually very hard for me to do because I'm so used to just saying everything's beautiful. So surface, right? We're yeah. used to just surface. Yeah. Words, so. We just got to remember that we're just starting to get into the profession and it's okay for us to make mistakes. That's mm -hmm. why we have our host educators. Yeah. Or at least that's why we are supposed to have them. Yeah. But sometimes you will get that host educator who will just not even be there. I just no kind of, yeah, I, that's probably what I had, problem that I had last semester is that when I did something, I didn't know if it was, like, bad or not, or when I did it, I didn't know it was bad until I went back to school, I was like, oh, that I did that, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, that's 
But you're still learning. Still, still. And one other reflection that or reflection pitfall that I think um, I could improve on is turning reflections into questions, right? So like whenever the kids are doing something, you're reflecting and you're just saying what it is that they're doing and then you're like, right? Is that right? But I liked how it said in here, um, how it explained it, yeah. So it says, I'm at, Jack says, I'm at the top. The adult says, you're excited to be so high, aren't you? Jack, you're right, teacher. So if the child, like if you were wrong, mm -hmm. the child would say, no, I'm actually really nervous and scared. Like, help me, right? Yeah. Like the child would, they would stop what they were doing and they would correct you, like this says. So to add the aren't you, it's more for yourself than it is for the child. Yeah. Like the reflection then becomes about you and not about the child because you're like, and you're, it's like you're um, questioning whether you're competent and you're observing correctly, right? It's like, I need to gain confidence from the child almost. Yeah. I need the child to validate what it is that I'm seeing yeah. when that's not the child's responsibility, right? You as an adult should just be like, wow, you are so excited to be high. Like, you know, yeah. that's just how I feel about it. And that's something that I'm, I real, I turn everything into a question because I just want, like with my kids, I just want them to talk to me all the time. Like tonight I was trying to get Raina to just tell me about her day. And like, what's good. So what did you do at school today? And she's like, I don't know. Oh, okay. And that's, what did you, that's what did you have, what did you eat at school today? A snack? Like, and sometimes I really just like don't, like I even with preschool, I find myself asking a question like, what did you do on the weekend? To me, that's a simple question. Like, what did you do on the weekend? Like, did you go to the splash pad? Did you go to the park? Did you go to the farmer's market? But I always get met with, I don't know. Oh, and I think it's, it's just because, and I, I truly know now that it's because they really don't know how to answer the question. So they just tell you, I don't know. Or they're, or like, you and you may think they actually don't know, but they're just trying to really fill it in because they don't know how to like bring the language yeah. and everything full circle so that they yeah. can be like, I did this on the weekend or I went with grandma on the weekend. Actually, that's a great point because I've noticed like when I'm more specific, like while I'm there's this one girl at her daycare that braids her hair all the time. Her oh, name yeah. is Kara. And so I'll ask her, like, uh, what, what do you do with Kara? And she says, like, Oh, I hug her and I talk to her, and, right? So once I get more specific, I do notice that she will answer me. I shouldn't have such broad questions. Like, what do you mean? Like, what did you go? Like, did I go to the gym? Like, did I go outside? Like, did I go to class? Like, I don't know. What is the question that you're asking me, Mom? Yeah. When, yeah. when, like, children start to get older, then more of the questions could get broader. It's just when they're so young, it's just... So they don't know how to answer a question that's like so much happened in my day. Mm -hmm. What what part of my day do you want to know? That, yeah, like for sure. I went to the gym, I went outside, I played with this person today. Yeah. It's all the stuff that I want to know. I guess I just have to like hone in more on what it is that I want to know specifically. Without coercing the children. Yes, exactly. Without coercing the children. Does anybody else have an issue with that? Because I know that I am not yeah. working I'm on a coercer. That. Working on that. I know that, like, within the chapter, the one I thing that's chapter four. We're supposed to do four and five. Yeah, we do two separate. I think so. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything else about well, chapter four? Okay, so the communication thing, um, communicating with parents and children, like having. Having, having the community, or no, that's not what I meant. Okay, so sorry. Pretend this is in the delete button there, Lou. Collaboration is what I meant. So, so the collaboration piece around language, culture, and food, I think is really, really important. Mm -hmm. I don't, like, I don't know if you guys saw that, but it's like up over here by the pitfalls. And um, it just talks about like um, collaboration with family members in supporting linguistic diverse children. And I notice, like, even, like, if you have, like, a couple children that come from different family backgrounds, like, other children will teach each other ch 
because of their languages. Like I've seen French children and Ojibwe children together, and one child's like, "Well, this is our word for bear, so mafla." And then you hear like the word in French, and like these children are teaching each other their language, but it's not for each other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So then to like to build upon that as like a teacher and to bring that into the classroom, like maybe you have. Maybe you have parents that, like, you want to come in and give them a mini language lesson or, like, you know, it's, I think it's, like, very important to, like, bring, hone in on that and bring it into the classroom because maybe, there's so many other cultures. Maybe having, like, a cultural day at the daycares or the schools that you're in would be really good for the children so that they learn more about not, not just their own culture mm -hmm. but everyone else's culture because not a lot of children, especially, like, these days, really learn about the culture. Other people's culture or other people. Yeah, it's more about themselves and their current family more than their background. Like, I, I don't know anything about my background, really, except the fact that I'm Irish and Scottish. That's, that's it. That's all I know. I have no traditions. I have nothing else besides that. That'd be great to know for Irish traditions and Scottish traditions. Learn both that as a child, but... Yeah, I think also I'm providing, like, a literacy-rich environment mm -hmm. where all of, like, those cultures and those languages are just readily available like maybe it's a poster on the wall or maybe you have like a few different books with like a whole bunch of different um traditions for scottish people and the flag and what is it they eat maybe you have some cassettes with like the language so that children can hear what different languages sound like and maybe it's a tv show right like there's a lot of literacy rich things that we can do to help diversify classrooms, maybe it's um, teaching children ASL for children of, if there's children in the class. Of ASL different. sign language? Yeah. yeah. Sign sign language. Language. And that would also bring down the level in the room, right? Mm -hmm. So that um, children with sensory issues might, it might benefit like a lot of children. And the children who like have trouble like saying like what they're feeling, they can also maybe like hone in on those feeling things and like Say to their teacher, like, like I feel sad. Like, this is how they I'm would feeling have, right now. Yeah, like, they would have multiple different avenues to express themselves. Maybe they're not excelling in English, but maybe they're excelling at ASL. Maybe they're not excelling at ASL, but maybe they're excelling in French or Ojibwe or something, right? So they, it opens up so many different avenues for children to express themselves and feel confident about what's going on inside of them. And I think that comes back to like sign language as a whole, like people think, okay, I'm going to learn a new language, I'm going to learn Scottish, or I'm going to learn Gaelic, or I'm going to learn Ojibwe, or Potawatomi, or Cree, or French. But people really don't stop to think that sign language is a type of language, whether you're yeah. actually speaking or not, or you're using your hands, it is a type of language. Mm -hmm. And if children can learn how to use that as like a another form of like communicating with us then i think that it would um kind of make things a little bit like less frustrating for them yeah it's just but as for educators sure. we would have to remember that in certain cultures certain different sign languages mean different things oh yes that's a, that's a good so because yeah, one sure. thing that's not offensive in like american sign languages could be offensive in russia uh, or Chantel, Africa. Right. We talked about that with Chantal the yeah. other day. Yeah. So it's like, I'm not sure. Like I know this means more, but it could mean something else in a different culture. That's true. And cut. <laughs>